Well, greetings from the west coast of Canada, where I am currently uh, visiting for about a week and a half. Um, very different light here, very different ambiance, very different clothing. Um, and so you're seeing me in uh, a very different context. And I'm sitting across from a kitchen right now, which you may see in a little while. Um, but I'm going to answer a question from Prue about what it's like to shoot these videos in, in my home, in my kitchen, in my bedroom, in my office, as opposed to doing it in a formal academic setting or on a stage or on a sound set. And I think for me what it's constructed is a very good opportunity to reflect very self-subjectively about what it means to talk about food, to talk about power and politics of food, to teach about food. Am I teaching you right now or am I just delivering a video that you then teach yourselves with? And by stripping away some of the, or by, by replacing the formal academic built environment with my own very personal environment, I, um, I, I don't have to perform quite in the same way as I might had I been standing in a lecture hall. Um, I also start to see, just by paying attention to that difference in feeling, that difference in affect and emotion that's within me as I record these videos, I get to then respond to those feelings and those, those sensations and share them with you and say, oh, this is what's going on for me right now. So by recording in my domestic space, I get to uh, play less a, a professor, professorial role and much more uh, a role that is close to my domestic self. And of course this makes me realize that there are different selves as well that I am performing constantly. I'm performing as David, my domestic, quiet, intimate, computer using, video recording self who is imagining people off in Australia somewhere listening to my voice in a few days. Um, but I also imagine myself as the artist as the person who uh, decorates it and imagines a character. I can also imagine myself as the academic me, the professorial me, the ones. I can also imagine myself as the academic me, the professorial me, the one sitting in the classroom almost with you right now, having a conversation about the selves and the performance of self and the framing of self. So, all of those different uh, performances and of the attention to those performances come forward certainly when I record a video in my home. But the other, the other thing to see, and as I have done in my past work, some of which I'll be sharing with you in text form, is that by situating art and epistemology in the kitchen, you start to see where the hidden and not so hidden powers and potentials of that kitchen space are and how they are sort of intuitively made whole because we are so habituated to the kitchen as a space of practice, whether it's uh, socializing or making food or preserving and storing food or design or any of the other things that kitchens have come to represent over time. Um, there's so much power, there's so much potential in there that when you start, again, attending to the subtleties of what you're doing and saying and how you're moving in that space, we often come to uh, understand the space differently and understand ourselves and our articulations within that space. So yeah, it's an ecosophic space and it's a good space to, to start to unpack some of the questions about power and politics and astronomy. Oh, hello! I didn't see you there. Did you see me? Where's my light? There it is. So this is a kitchen I've also spent a good amount of time in over my life, over the last 20 years, uh, intermittently. It's a kitchen in which I've made uh, fermented vegetables. It's a kitchen in which I've had meals on my own. It's a kitchen that you can see is maybe you can't see, is in the country, in the woods. 
It's a very simple kitchen. And right now it's a kitchen that's entirely packed up because the cottage that it's in is about to be sold after, as I had said, after 20 years of my coming here. And so it's a space that's both very familiar and intimate to me and very simple. Not a lot of stuff in here. It's probably about 10 feet by eight feet. And it's also a place that I'm feeling a little bit melancholy to be standing in because it's now not gonna be a place I come to anymore after this visit. But in the absence of things, and the absence of dishes and appliances and smells and people, lively people having conversations, there's a very strong sweetness for me here because it's a place that I have a very intimate relationship with myself in. This is the place I came to after breaking up with my partner of seven years and I'd never felt happier to be alone and in the quiet and under the stars and with a few deer and chipmunks running around. Um, so that connection will always be with me. And I think this is an important part of ecosophy and gastronomy is the way a kitchen is very much an ecosophic space in that it's very much a meeting point of my relationship with myself. Very often there are other human beings in here socializing, eating, drinking, cooking, learning from each other, teaching each other. Um, and then obviously it's a built environment. It's a, it's a space of uh, non-human things that have all their own kinds of agencies. So in this super intimate and also very open space, we can pay attention to all sorts of different articulations between those different ecological registers, but in a kind of holistic way, in a way that is very um, intuitive, because we all have spent time in kitchens at some point in our lives. We often spend a great deal of time in our kitchens. So the separations between the ecologies are less obvious because this is such a, a whole integrated space. And I think that makes it a very important space for thinking about uh, epistemological questions and thinking about how knowledge is constructed. And you, th you think about all the different knowledges that it takes to operate this, this space. And if you think about all of the different ways in which people interact and share knowledge in this space, formally and informally, then you get to a really strong understanding of how this can be usefully ecosophic. And so one of the things I've done in the past is work with two other colleagues and we collaboratively wrote a book chapter on the performativities of making texts. But we did that in our kitchens and we started very much in a setup like this, except instead of it being a video camera um, recording, it was a Skype camera allowing us to interact with another person in another kitchen in a different city. And that text, which I'll share an excerpt with, uh, of, with you, is um, very, I think, representative of what I've just tried to articulate about this idea of the, the kitchen as ecosophic space. It, when, when you pay attention to what happens in it, when you, when you attend to the performativities and the performances that take place in the space, you can start to tease them apart and see where those whole uh, ecologies can be parsed into three different ecological registers and then put back together again or never separated in the first place just to witness what kind of power there is in words, in material, and in all sorts of different lively culinary and non-culinary actions. So this is another kitchen that I'm also very familiar with. This is also a space I've been coming to for a very long time. It's close to the kitchen uh, that I've just shown you. And it's uh, my parents' kitchen. It's where they've been living for about 18, 19 years. And um, it's, a, it's an intimate space. It's an open space. Uh, there's a great view of the, the sea just over my shoulder to the right here. And there's a lot more light. It's warmer than the other one. And there's a lot more stuff in it. But it's also a kitchen I'm much less comfortable in, in some ways, than the smaller, sparer one. And that's partly because the, the habits that this kitchen reinforces are very much my parents' habits. And when I try to interact in this space with them, um, I constantly run into those habits because my habits in my own kitchens are not the same.
And so there's a clash of patterning and performances that happen and we get in each other's way and we often frustrate each other or my mother turns off the stove before the water is boiled and I'm not ready for that kind of uh, interference in my habitual patterns in the kitchen. But what this raises for me is the very important role of power in the kitchen. And historically, kitchens have been often called spaces of disempowerment, particularly for women, but for those people who operate in the domestic space and whose work is often made invisible by that. Well, in this kitchen, the work is very visible. It's open on all sides. People can gather and socialize and see what's going on. But moreover, the idea that a kitchen is disempowering simply because it's about domestic work may be false. Um, in fact, I believe it is false. And what you can see in many kitchens when you look at them through different perspectives of knowledge exchange, learning, and epistemology, you see that these are spaces where knowledge and domestic practice of, and the knowledges of domestic practice um, actually give enormous power to those who wield them. And very often the transfer of that power is something that's met with resistance. So in many cultures where food knowledge or culinary knowledge is passed on from one woman to the next, there will be a holding on of the nature of a recipe and even the, the resistance to the transfer of a recipe, whether it's written or performed. Um, there are many examples in the research of uh, senior women in the family not telling the junior women in the family exactly how a given dish is made or giving the recipe but omitting certain details. And it will indeed be very often at the very end of the senior woman's active life as a role of power in the family uh, that she'll formally or completely transfer over the, the knowledge of that recipe. Well, that's, that's a retention of power. That's a desire to hold on to it and not lose it and then become in some ways irrelevant to the family dynamics. That's, a, that's maybe a, a dramatization of what's going on, but those, those senses of power and the knowledge that one has of one's space that gives you that power are playing out constantly in spaces like this. I think what's very important about looking at the kitchen as a space of epistemology and as a space of politics and gastronomy is that it forces us to recognize how power plays out and power relationships are different in different spaces and that space often helps inform how those relationships do play out. Um, moreover, when you see what kinds of articulations there are between different uh, ecological registers in a space like a kitchen, you start to be able to see them perhaps more clearly in uh, more formal political spaces, that is in policy making contexts or in farms and land negotiations or even in spaces like supermarkets where there's a different kind of power being played out that's a little bit less intimate, less personal. Um, the, the play, the interplay between the small and reproductive domestic spaces of power and the large and productive and non-domestic but you know, professional or social spaces of power, those, those interplays help us start seeing what might be going on in terms of different agencies and actors who wield those agencies. So that's why the kitchen, yes, is a very important place for uh, for doing this kind of work and then also for potentially shooting videos and uh, thinking about different forms of gastronomic agency. And so here I am in kitchen number three. Um, this is a kitchen up island from where my parents live. Still on the west coast of Canada in the new home of my friends Katie and Cohen. And the last time I visited them, they lived in a yurt. And it was a big round space. And this kitchen was very different. This kitchen was not this kitchen. The only thing that I recognize is this sink. And it's the sink that they had in the old place. And it's the sink that continues to be here now. And so there's a... a 
sort of desire on my part to say that the kitchen retains its agency and its power, to, even though it's been completely reconfigured, even though the appliances are different, because there's a continuity of an object that, that evokes a kind of history and that suggests a next set of performances that might happen in here. And so we just had a big, beautiful fried breakfast. That's something that we might have equally had in the, in the yurt. But now we're having it here in this much more modern square box of a kitchen that's uh, extremely efficient and yet not as open and loose as the old space. So does the, the agency of that kitchen from before in the round, loose, open space in the country carry over to this more urban, more stylish, let's say, kitchen? Maybe. Um, and maybe the power of the kitchen continues even though the place has changed and the people have changed and the times have changed. But then there's also something to be said that, that the kitchen and the humans and all the stuff in it and around it are in a perpetual performative dynamic with each other to create the kind of agencies and the collective power that we wield as, a, as an assemblage, as a whole, as an ecosophic collective. And that's, I think, more true and more representative of what politics and food are all about as well, is that it's not one thing that holds all power or that dominates the situation, but it's a constant negotiation. In my own kitchen in Montreal, which you've seen, it's very clumsy and clunky and weird and funky, and I've done a lot of stuff to make it work for me. As I've described in the Chopping Block Lounge project, I have this relationship with the things in my kitchen, including my big chopping block, including my weird and wonky stove that is at a bit of an angle. So whenever I'm frying meat in the pan, the oil will slip to one side and one will be deep fat frying and the other side will be dry frying. And so even there, I've got a relationship with this device that forces me into an arrangement of agencies that are not solely mine, not solely the stoves, not solely the food itself, but all of us together. So once again, it's about the collective and it's about performing these, these dynamics, these politics as, as a multiple and not as an individual. So in that sense, yes, politics is definitely a performative process. I would say almost everything is. And that when you start seeing that there's a lot of give and take constantly, between all of the different forces in the world of gastronomy, then you start recognizing how gastronomy and politics are constantly intertwined, constantly negotiated, and there's always power up for grabs in whatever space you're inhabiting. Mm -hmm.